Hello and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be part four of the end game series. Casper is the monetary black hole. So this video is going to be talking about the value proposition of Casper and how high it could potentially go in the long term and where the sources of its future market cap are likely to come from. So before we get into it today, guys, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and also turn on notifications so that you don't miss any of my future videos. So in Endgame Part 3, we talked about the sovereign debt crisis and how central banks and governments are essentially insolvent at this point and how they need you to hold fiat or debt so that they can essentially rug pull you and use your holding of that fiat or debt to pay down the national debt that has been built up. And we talked about what the likely consequence of this rug pull will be, which is that wealth will try to flee fiat and debt. And that is essentially because of human nature. And if you see yourself holding this fiat money or owning bonds and you see yourself getting poorer because of that and other people becoming richer for not holding this then it is human nature to want to exit that poisonous asset and as more wealth exits the dollar and other fiat money will weaken even more and as the dollar and other fiat money weakens even more wealth will start to flee and this has the potential to enter a debt doom loop or a debt doom spiral where because more wealth is exiting, they have to weaken the dollar even more, which causes more wealth to exit, leading essentially to a negative feedback loop. And this period will be a period of higher inflation and also higher capital controls. And over time, as a rule, weak money trends towards strong money. We have gone from cowrie shells to copper and iron to gold and silver, then transitioning to fiat money, and now we are in the process of transitioning to the cryptocurrency standard. And this is an inevitable process over time, but it can be sped up by certain events, such as inflation, war, natural disaster, and also financial repression. And so in this episode, we're going to get into why these certain events cause wealth to flee the weaker money and trend towards the stronger money. And therefore, we are going to be looking at the various forms of weaker money that exist and the total value that the stronger money of cryptocurrency could capture from these weaker forms of money. So total global wealth is around $900 trillion, with a large percentage of that being in real estate, bonds, and also fiat money. And so currently, Bitcoin contains around $1 trillion of wealth, and Casper contains around 3 to $4 billion of wealth at the time of recording of this video. So really, we are going to be looking at how much of the wealth stored in these various different assets can be captured by crypto. And that is because of something called a monetary premium. So these different forms of money, such as equities, real estate, bonds, and fiat, they have a monetary premium attached to them. And the reason that they have this attached to them is because they are better forms of money than the dollar in many ways. Because the dollar and all fiat currency is such a poor store of value, anything which acts as a better store of value, even if it is potentially less portable or less liquid, will naturally accrue some of that monetary premium of the wealth and of the stored energy that wants to get out of the dollar, which is leaking and losing so much stored energy and so much stored value, and instead find a better asset which will store the value more efficiently. And so, for example, something like real estate. Real estate obviously has a real world utility value where you can live in a house and you can have your own space and decorate it and customize it as much as you want to. So there is a real world utility value there, which has a certain monetary value attached to it. However, part of the value that is stored in real estate currently is from the fact that real estate is a much better form of money and a much better store of value than fiat money. If you are talking to friends and family, they will probably always encourage you to buy a house and to take out a mortgage to get a house because at least then you are on the housing ladder and that house will always go up in value compared to the dollar. And the same is true for something like gold, where gold has a real world industrial value and an industrial demand for things like electronics and jewelry. And that is a real world value where you can make better devices and also look flashy and look cool wearing gold jewelry. But a lot of the value of gold comes from the fact that it is a good store of value. And so there are some people and some money buying gold for that industrial demand and for that jewelry use case. And there is a lot of money going into gold purely because that gold is a good store of value and has a relatively high stock to flow ratio and a relatively low rate of debasement. However, with the emergence of cryptocurrency, because cryptocurrency is a far better store of value and a far better form of money and a far better medium of exchange than all of these other assets, 
crypto will demonetize all assets to their base industrial value as it is the superior monetary technology and the entire monetary premium that is stored in these other assets which is there because they act as a better form of money than the dollar because this new superior monetary technology has come along in the form of cryptocurrency the entire monetary premium of these different assets will bleed to the superior monetary technology and that superior monetary technology like a black hole will suck the monetary value out of all of these assets now the superior monetary technology whichever cryptocurrency it is is 100 monetary premium as you can see in this chart here bitcoin has zero industrial demand and zero utility value but the value from these cryptocurrencies come because they are a good form of money and so just to define some definitions here when i am talking about crypto in this video i am talking about bitcoin and i am talking about casper i've done many videos on other cryptocurrencies such as proof of stake protocols and the drawbacks they have and why they are essentially in the long run a bad form of money so when I refer to cryptocurrency in this video, I'm talking about Bitcoin and I'm talking about Casper. So currently there are thousands of cryptocurrencies out there all competing in the monetary arms race and all vying for that monetary premium from these other assets. However, the vast majority of these assets will not survive in the long term because if there are too many of these assets and various competing forms of money, then that is more like a system of barter on the left there where you have hundreds of different floating exchange rates and between these different forms of money. Whereas the vastly more likely scenario is the scenario on the right where all these goods and services, instead of having a floating exchange exchange rate with all other goods and services, they instead have one or two exchange rates to a superior form of money, which is likely to be Bitcoin and Casper. And so first of all, we are going to look at gold. So why is crypto better than gold as money? Well, because gold is physical, it is much less portable than the digital forms of money, such as cryptocurrency. And also because of this physicality, it is much less divisible. You know, if you have a large gold bar, and you want to pay for goods and services which only cost 1 20th of that gold bar then you likely have to melt that gold bar down into smaller units so it is possible and it is divisible but it's much less convenient whereas cryptocurrency is essentially infinitely divisible while gold has a relatively high stock to flow ratio it does not have a maximum fixed supply and around about every 50 to 60 years your share of the total amount of gold you own out of all the gold in the world is cut in half so it's a relatively long half-life, 60 years, but compare that to the half-life of both Bitcoin and Casper, which have fixed supplies. The half-life of Bitcoin and Casper, when they are at full issuance, is essentially infinity and your share of the ledger will never be able to be diluted. And another issue with gold, because it is physical, is the cost of security. The more wealth that you have in gold, the higher the cost of security needed to secure that gold. For example, you would never keep a billion dollars of gold in a house in the middle of a housing estate. More likely, you need to use somewhere like Fort Knox in America. And because gold, especially large amounts of gold, is difficult to self-custody. If you have your gold with a custodian, then there is a risk of rehypothecation and more claims on that gold being traded than the actual amount of gold that exists. And two more issues are is that gold is able to be forged in the sense that if you get a metal with the same mass of gold, make a bar of that and then coat the outer part of that bar in gold, then you are able to sell a bar of gold which contains much, much less gold than the actual weight would imply. And also, because gold is physical, with enough force it is seizable and it can be confiscated. And so this brings us onto the question of how much of gold can cryptocurrency capture with the total amount of wealth being stored in gold around 12 trillion. So according to the World Gold Council, gold demand for technology was 300 tonnes in 2023 whereas the total annual demand of gold was around 4,000 tonnes, which puts the industrial use percentage of gold at around 7 to 8%. However, we are going to take an ultra-conservative view of this and a large margin of error and say that instead of gold having a 7 to 8% industrial value, let's say it has a 50% industrial value and therefore a 50% monetary value. Well, that means that the monetary value stored in gold is around 6 trillion. And so now we're going to look at why is cryptocurrency better than real estate as money. 
because real estate is physical and difficult to move, you have a property tax on it. That means that one to two percent of the wealth you have stored within that real estate is bleeding towards the government every year. Real estate also has a maintenance cost associated with it, whereas cryptocurrency does not. Um, real estate is non-portable and it stays fixed in one place. So it is not a particularly liquid or convenient form of money. Um, real estate has no fixed supply. So when the price of real estate goes up and house builders are incentivized to build more houses and to dilute your share of the housing ledger. So as a place to store wealth, um, you are constantly fighting against the home builders. Um, real estate is fragile, so it can be destroyed. You know, if you have the vast majority of your wealth stored in real estate, and then war comes to that region where you have that wealth stored, and your real estate is destroyed, then your wealth has just been wiped out and destroyed. And while that is, of course, a rare circumstance, periodically, you know, generationally, wars do happen. And so this is why things like war, accelerate the speed of wealth transfer from a weak money like real estate to a strong money historically like gold but now like cryptocurrency. Real estate is also confiscatable and because it is not portable in any way, in extreme circumstances it can be confiscated. It's non-fungible so it's difficult to exactly value one piece of real estate against another piece of real estate. Um, it's illiquid and you need to find a buyer for your specific bit of real estate in order to actually access your wealth and it is also non-divisible. So if you want to access a smaller portion of your wealth, say 10% of it, but it is locked up in real estate, then it is not easily accessible and you would have to take out a new mortgage and you are not able to really sell just one small piece of your real estate. And so this is the chart of the value of real estate versus the value of cryptocurrency over the past 15 years. And as you can see, the value of real estate is absolutely collapsing against the value of cryptocurrency. And so this graph I'm showing you because this is important to try and visualize the monetary premium that is attached to real estate. Because when you look at a graph of house prices versus the US dollar, or really any other fiat currency, then it looks like a great investment because it is going up in value. And compared to the dollar, it is a fantastic place to store your wealth. But now that we have the superior monetary asset of cryptocurrency, well, now the value of real estate is going down and we're likely to continue trending down essentially forever because it is the less scarce asset versus the more scarce asset and the worse, weaker form of money versus the stronger form of money. And so basically you have to ask yourself, how much would you be willing to pay for a house if it never went up in value again? At the minute, you're willing to pay a premium for a house because at least it will go up in value and at least it will be a good place to store your wealth and potentially increase your wealth. But when you measure the opportunity cost of owning real estate versus owning the superior monetary technology of cryptocurrency, then it is now a huge opportunity cost. And naturally, the amount that you are willing to pay for that luxury of owning a home and having your own space will be much less. It will always be there and there will always be a price that you're willing to pay because there is a real world value attached to having your own place and your own real estate and your own place to live. But essentially, investment property will no longer exist. So real estate will be completely demonetized. And real estate now essentially will be a depreciating asset like a fancy sports car. And people will always pay money for a fancy sports car and people will always pay money for real estate. But it is no longer a good place to store your wealth. And so, again, I've taken what I think is quite a conservative estimate and saying that 25% of the value in real estate is the monetary premium and 75% of the value is the actual utility value that it brings to people. And that would put the amount of monetary premium in real estate at 82.5 trillion. And so this brings us on to equities. Why is cryptocurrency better than equities as money? So equities essentially have an unlimited supply. And if the shareholders decide to issue more shares, then they are able to dilute your percentage holding of that business. Businesses always carry some sort of operational risk with them. And there are many that I could go through, but essentially owning a business is always inherently risky from competition from other businesses to technological advancement to having a CEO who doesn't know what they're doing. So even if you own a company with a good moat, then over time, that company is essentially always at risk. And to think about this, you know, can you name a company from 100 years ago that is currently more valuable now than it was back 100 years ago? It's quite a different thing to do. So over time, owning a business is inherently more risky. Equities are non-fungible between other equities and between other businesses. Equities are inherently less liquid. And again, you have to find a willing buyer for that particular company that you want to own. And equities are seizable. 
and in extreme political climates, you could have those equities taken from you. So this is not to say that cryptocurrency will outperform equities forever. This here is a graph of Nvidia when measured in Bitcoin. And as you can see from certain periods, Nvidia has actually outperformed Bitcoin, at least since 2014. So there will certainly be particular stocks that outperform crypto. And that is because these stocks are providing a real world value and a real world productivity boost to the world. However, inherently, equities will always be more risky than just holding money. Because if you are looking for a yield on money, which is using money to make more money, this inherently involves the risk of getting less money. And you are taking a risk and making a bet that you can make more money. And this is particularly relevant when the money supply is fixed. You know, in today's environment, it's relatively easy to make money on stock. You just buy the S&P 500 and it goes up by 10% a year. But when the money supply is fixed, you have to ensure that that business is actually providing real world value and is actually able to capture a larger share of the ledger than they previously had. And so again, I'm going to go quite conservative on this and say that 25% of the value in equities is monetary premium, which makes the total monetary premium 28.75 trillion. And so why is crypto better than fiat as money? Um, this one should be relatively obvious, but fiat has an unlimited supply and it is controlled by a centralized authority on how much supply they should issue. Fiat essentially incentivizes huge debt bubbles to form because people are trying to do anything they can to get out of fiat. Um, fiat is easier to counterfeit and it is less verifiable. Fiat is censorable, so if you upset the powers that be and the centralized structures that issue fiat, then you may no longer be able to transact in fiat. And also fiat is seizable and it can be taken from you at very little cost in both the physical sense of someone actually coming and taking your money and also in the sense of inflating away your share of the ledger. And so how much of fiat can cryptocurrency capture? Well, fiat, because it has no utility value, is 100% monetary value. And to me, it is difficult to see a world in 100 plus years time where anybody uses fiat because of the disadvantages that using fiat puts you at. However, for now, we're going to be conservative and we're going to say 25% of the value of fiat currency is monetary premium. And so that would make the monetary premium in fiat currency around $30 trillion. And so now we're going to get onto why is cryptocurrency better than bonds as money? And bonds essentially have much the same issues and much the same problems as fiat in the sense that more debt can always be issued and the value of that debt can be inflated away by printing more fiat money. Bonds also have counterparty risk. So you are trusting that someone is going to be able to pay you back the principal and also make enough money to also pay you back the interest. And so the natural interest rate is the rate of GDP growth plus the risk premium, you know, when the interest rate is not set by the Federal Reserve. Because if you are lending someone money and they are returning to you less than the actual amount of GDP growth, then you're better off just not lending them money and just holding the money and letting the value accrue to the money instead. Because in a fixed money standard, bonds are a zero sum game and you have to ensure that the person that you are lending money to is able to, again, capture a larger percentage of the ledger than they previously had. And so bonds will still exist in a cryptocurrency standard because bonds are essentially just another way of trying to make a yield on your money by using your money to make more money. However, again, this is inherently more risky than just holding your money. And again, this is particularly relevant in a monetary system with a fixed supply. So it's almost certain that the percentage of money in bonds will be less than it is now. So once again, we will take a conservative estimate and assume that only 25% of the money in bonds is the current monetary premium. And that puts the total monetary premium in bonds at 75 trillion. And so when you take all of these figures from all of these monetary premiums, that adds up to around $222.25 trillion of monetary premium that the superior monetary technology and cryptocurrency of Bitcoin and Casper can capture. And again, these are based off conservative estimates of monetary premium and also do not account for the future real GDP growth that the world will likely be experiencing. And so this is a slightly more conservative estimate than the 2045 base case that Michael Saylor, who is essentially the CEO of Bitcoin, put forward for the base case of Bitcoin, arguing that his base case is $280 trillion by 2045. 
And another huge result of having this monetary premium go from these physical assets of real estate, gold, equities, fiat, and bonds is that this monetary premium previously had to be protected and defended with military law and proof of force and essentially proof of work. But we are now transferring that monetary premium from a physical asset to a digital asset which cannot be physically seized. And the only way to seize that asset is by providing enough work and proof of work. So the monetary premium which was previously protected by violence is now going to be protected and defended with physics and electricity and also math. Because previously, if you have someone with a huge amount of wealth, and they are not defending that wealth properly, then you are incentivized to actually physically take that wealth from them. But now that physically taking that wealth from them is no longer possible, it really changes the equation of the game. On top of this, we are likely about to enter an exponential age. So likely, we are not too far away from a period of huge real GDP growth with essentially infinite intelligence coming from AI and near infinite manpower coming from robots. And this means that we will essentially all be getting more for less or in other words the total global real gdp and total global real wealth is about to explode and per unit of energy we are all about to become a lot richer over the next sort of 10 to 20 to 30 years the entire world is about to become a lot richer and so this is a concept talked about in a book called the price of tomorrow with a fixed supply of money and accelerating productivity growth. Your fixed share of the ledger will be able to buy increasingly more and more goods. And because the real GDP and real wealth of the world is growing and increasing over time, your fixed share of the ledger will be able to purchase more of the more abundant goods and services that are around. And essentially this is productivity driven deflation. And in a natural world where money printing is not possible, it means that your money will constantly be increasing in value and the value that is accrued from that productivity growth is accruing to your money. Now there are a few arguments against crypto and one of these is that it is essentially far too volatile but the argument against this is that the volatility will and essentially already is reducing as the market cap grows in both size and in liquidity. Money historically has been the most liquid and saleable good basically meaning that it is the asset that is most difficult to move in price because it is the most liquid and most valuable good. So stability is an output of being a good money and a good money will always become more stable over time as a result of being a good money and the same is true for acceptability you know currently cryptocurrency is not widely accepted at all but once again acceptability is an output of being a superior money and will come to all superior monies over time for example you know the people of yap initially did not accept gold and they only accepted their raystones but eventually over time because gold was the superior money they eventually had to start accepting gold because of the disadvantage they were put at by using their inferior form of money of the raystones. So the reason I've been talking about crypto in terms of Bitcoin and Casper is because Bitcoin has that Achilles heel where it is an incredibly powerful and an incredibly good network but it just has that one small issue of scalability and because of that one small issue it cannot work as an effective medium of exchange for it to operate on layer twos it has to be centralized and this centralization opens up attack vectors essentially using layer twos will put you at a disadvantage by using bitcoin on layer twos and it will mean that other people are able to gain an advantage over you. Therefore, Bitcoin and Bitcoin layer twos are very unlikely to be used as the medium of exchange over any extended period of time as they have this centralized attack vector. And this is essentially due to the concept of anti-fragility. During these periods of chaos, such as war, natural disaster, fourth turnings, and financial repression, then Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and on the layer twos will weaken during all of these periods because to use it on the layer twos eventually you are going to have to use custodial services and essentially trade paper bitcoin and because you are using a custodian that custodial service or bitcoin bank can either seize or be targeted by governments to seize the assets that you have. So as a medium of exchange during these chaotic periods, 
then anyone who wishes to regularly use their Bitcoin but is too poor to use the base layer will have to find a different asset to use if they don't want to be put at a disadvantage. And we can kind of see this because Bitcoin essentially used to be accepted by many companies and it was experiencing real world adoption. But over time, one by one, these companies have stopped accepting Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. For example, Steam, Tesla, Reddit, Microsoft and Expedian and they stopped accepting it due to its weakness as a medium of exchange and due to its slow transactions and high transaction fees. Whereas Casper slowly is gaining real world adoption as a medium of exchange and more and more places are starting to accept it as a form of payment and as a medium of exchange. And so therefore because of this first of all we are going to analyze the digital silver model where Bitcoin is treated as the global store of value and sovereign collateral. However, Casper is held as spending money, money that has a high level of circulation and a high velocity. And so although they both have a fixed supply, as per the power laws, Bitcoin eventually grows at a slightly faster rate as it has a higher exponent, meaning that it remains a slightly better store of value. But because Casper fills the gap in the market left by Bitcoin's portability issue, they can coexist, as did gold and silver throughout history. And it's sort of a bi metallic or bi cryptic standard. And so this graph shows that this could be a reality, with the orange line showing the yearly returns of Bitcoin power law fair value, and the green line showing the yearly returns of the Casper but power law fair value and in 2059 the yearly returns of bitcoin will be slightly higher than the yearly returns of casper and so it's very difficult to predict what percentage of the monetary premium that digital gold versus digital silver would have but we can look to history to try and help us out so historically gold and silver have had a 1 to 15 price ratio with one ounce of gold being worth 15 ounces of silver and by the end of the 19th century, it is estimated that approximately 10,000 metric tons of gold had been mined. And during the same period, it is estimated that approximately 300,000 metric tons of silver had been mined. So using both the price and supply ratios, we can work out an estimated historical market cap of silver to gold. And for those of you who are interested in how I've done this, you can pause it now. But for those of you who just want to know, we will move on. And so I'm using two models under the digital silver model. First of all is the 10% model, where 10% of the money market is captured by Casper as the better medium of exchange, and 90% of the money market is captured by Bitcoin as the better store of value. And using that previous figure of $222 trillion of potential value capture, this would put Bitcoin at a price of 9.5 million, and it would put Casper at a price of $774 per Casper. However, under the model which was likely historically more accurate is the 2 to 1 model, so 66% of the money market is captured by Casper as the better medium of exchange, and 33% of the money market is captured by Bitcoin as the better store of value, which was roughly the same ratios that gold and silver had as a share of the money market market cap. And under this model, this would put Bitcoin at a price of $3.5 million, and it would put Casper at a price of $5,156. However, Casper is the trilemma solver. Casper is the only asset that can allow every single human on earth to participate fairly in an asset that gives them full monetary self-sovereignty and freedom from fiat slavery. It is essentially the true vision of Satoshi, with no proof of stake, no layer twos, no sub 51% attacks, and no node centralization. Casper essentially has no attack vectors. And this is a concept that Michael Saylor talked about in the physics of money. If you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. And that's a quote by Nikola Tesla. And so the energy of the money is the capital, wealth, and value that is stored in the money. And the frequency is equivalent to the duration and the lifespan. And the vibration is equivalent to the trade, transfer, and exchange of the money. So Bitcoin does perfectly on the energy and frequency side, but Bitcoin, because it has a low rate of trade, transfer, and exchange, has a low vibration. Whereas Casper perfectly embodies the energy, frequency, and vibration. And Casper has a higher vibration of energy than Bitcoin does. And there's a concept of winner-take-all effects in markets. So markets where a slight advantage in performance leads to outsized rewards driven by network effects create a positive feedback loop. And essentially means that all value and all of the monetary premium could and will accrue to that money which gives a slight advantage in performance. And that asset 
is Casper. Casper is the superior monetary technology. And so we're going to be looking now at the superior monetary technology model, or basically what the potential end game could be for Casper. And this is a model where Casper acts as both the medium of exchange and the store of value. Casper acts as the superior monetary technology and fills all areas of the money market and takes 100% of the monetary premium that is stored in these weaker forms of money. And that is because Casper has a higher score on the portability front than Bitcoin does. And it is essentially the perfect form of money. And in this model, the entire $222.25 trillion of monetary premium on value would accrue to Casper and Casper would absorb that entire monetary premium that exists within these weaker forms of money. And so based off my personal estimates of monetary premiums and a market cap of Casper at $222.25 trillion, that would put the value of one Casper at $7,744. Now, it has to be stipulated that more than likely, this is not within our lifetimes. This is a slow process, which will take many decades, if not centuries. And I just want to compare this to the bull case of Michael Saylor and the sort of maximum price that he would expect for Bitcoin in 2049. Well, the equivalent would put Casper at a value of $35,888 per Casper. And so, you know, even if I'm wildly wrong on this and I'm off by a factor of 100 or even off by a factor of 1000, then the potential value proposition and the potential value capture of Casper is insane. And currently, 1,366 Casper, which is the equivalent percentage share of the network as one Bitcoin, costs around $258. And bearing in mind that there is only enough Casper in the world for everyone to own 3.5 Casper each, and that is with the current world population, not future estimates of what the world population will be. For $259, you can own 390% more Casper than the maximum supply for each human. So again, even if I am wildly wrong with these calculations and with these estimates, in the long term, the value proposition of what the next form of money actually is and how much market cap will accrue to that form of money is just insane. And so the risk reward of Casper at the minute is a once in a generation buy. It is a once in a generation risk to reward. You know, even if I am wrong and it does go to zero, then that's $259 that you've lost. But if you calculate how much 1366 Casper would be worth under any of the models that I've shown you, and even if you say I'm off by a factor of 100, then it is still an insane risk to reward. And probably you are nowhere near bullish enough on the long-term prospects of where Casper could go and the long-term value proposition that Casper actually has of becoming the money of the world and acting as the superior monetary technology and being essentially the end game. So thank you very much for watching. Again, please don't forget to like and subscribe and also leave a comment for the algorithm. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching and until next time, cheers.